love, the first key to the kingdom of God. Chapter 6, The Spiritual Hunger for God. One horrible misconception and false belief among us is that we love God enough by going to church regularly and doing the little things we do. This is always a pitfall, giving most Christians false sense of comfort zone and security. However, there is a level of intensity of love of God that is expected from us in our relationship with him as his children. The intensity of love that drives a true child of God crazy about God and things of God. No one can attain this level except through the presence of the Spirit of God. This is a love relationship with God when nothing else comes second to Him, much less before Him in the affairs of life. It is a spiritual hunger for God that passes all understanding. It is such an overwhelming hunger that gets God's attention and makes him not pass over his own. Unfortunately, most Christians neither have nor understand this spiritual hunger. Rather, they assume wrongly that they have enough love for God until they are confronted with a test or trial. Forsaking all for the love of God. One of the greatest tests of our love of God is the willingness to give it all up, including that which we consider to be the most important thing to us for the kingdom. How far are we willing to go? We say we love God with all our hearts, but wait until we are tested or afflicted. Blessed is he who does not offend God at the breaking point of trial or affliction. This point was clearly exemplified in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 19, in the story of the rich young ruler. As the story goes, a certain rich young man came to Jesus and asked him what good he could do in order to enter into the kingdom of God. See Matthew chapter 19 verse 16. Jesus told him to keep God's commandments if he desired eternal life. Verse 17. And the rich young man sought to know which commandments he should keep. And the Lord answered by citing some of the commandments while leaving out the most important commandment, love, verses 18 and 19. Now hear the rich young man. All these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? Matthew chapter 19, verse 20. That sounds like most of us. We assume we are complete in our love of God above everything. Yet, when tested, we fall flat on our faces and short of the most important commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 5. In response to his boastful question, the Lord threw in a test of love of God. If you want to be perfect, go. Sell what you have and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. Matthew chapter 19 verse 21. Of course, we know the reaction of the rich young man. Indignation and unwillingness to part with his worldly possessions for the love of God. Verse 22. There are two spiritual lessons related to this biblical encounter. A. The rich young man was not only imperfect with the things of God, but he also lacked the greatest thing or commandment. And as such, he lacked everything. In that story, the rich young man was not willing to forsake everything for the love of God. And since he was unwilling to forsake all the things of this world to follow Jesus, he could not truly say he loved God with all his heart, soul, and strength above everything else for he preferred the gift to the giver. As it is written, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and is himself destroyed or lost? Luke chapter 9, verses 23 to 25. B. Again, the rich young man lacked the second great commandment, 
the love for others as God loved him. Since he was not freely willing to part with his worldly possessions for the love for others, he demonstrated that he did not love others as himself or as God loved him. Hence, he considered his worldly possessions more important and valuable than the love for God and others. This is so since giving to the poor is giving to God. The rich young man lacked the true love for God. For that, he, the rich young man, woefully failed the test of love of God. Of course, we must not rush into judgment against the rich young man, being mindful of the enormous dilemma he was confronted with. But the story demonstrated to us how fragile most of us are when we are confronted with a serious test or trial of our love of God. That is why the Lord left us with no doubt of the all-important nature of this spiritual hunger for God. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Luke chapter 14, verse 26. To clarify this point the more, the Lord again said, So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, he cannot be my disciple. Luke chapter 14, verse 33. The two scripture verses just cited above are very widely misunderstood, exaggerated, and misused as manipulative instruments or tools in the hands of unscrupulous people. We know the Lord never asked us to hate or cut off all our relations or to forsake all things. Rather, he was driving this one important point home. That is, we do not love God with everything in and about us and therefore not worthy for the kingdom of God if there is possibly any person or thing or circumstance that takes precedence over God in our lives. If there is anything that we are not truly and readily willing to give up for the sake of the love we have for God, then we do not truly love him. It is an all or nothing relationship, for our God is a jealous God who does not share his glory with any man or thing. The early apostles of the Lord truly demonstrated this spiritual hunger for God. And by so doing, they left us with examples to follow. In the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4, we read that when Jesus asked Peter and his brother Andrew to follow him, they left everything and followed him. See Matthew chapter 4 verses 18 to 20. And that was the same thing with the Apostle John and his brother James. They left all, including their father, and followed him. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Matthew chapter 4 verse 22. The apostle Matthew did the same when the Lord asked him to follow him. Seeking God with all our hearts. From the beginning, God had revealed to us the nature of the spiritual hunger for him that yields the right result. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. Jeremiah chapter 29 verse 13. So merciful is our God that he never leaves us without examples to follow. By way of demonstration, he used his friend Abraham when he asked him to offer his only son, heir, as a sacrifice to him. Because Abraham was willing to sacrifice his only son out of burning spiritual hunger for God and never valued what God gave him as above God, God blessed him above all humans. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Genesis chapter 22 verse 12. Abraham demonstrated his absolute love of and hunger for God, and God commands us to do the same. Again, as a demonstration of his absolute love for us, God sacrificed everything for those who mean everything to him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. John chapter 3 verse 16. 
The question then is, what is God worth to you? If God is worth everything to you, you ought to give everything to seek him and his righteousness. This is the only and most needful thing that is imperishable. For in truth, we shall inevitably leave and forsake all and be forsaken by all. The day will soon come when none of us will remember our businesses, jobs, wealth, children and parents, and so forth. For it is written that we are appointed to die once and then to be subjected to judgment before the Lord of Lords. It is certainly true then that everyone must surely repent one way or the other. It is either repentance to life now or regret in hell later. The painful thing is that in most cases we rebel, resist, and offend God with what he has graciously given us, thereby valuing the gift more than the giver. The first and the last. Let me share with you some mysteries surrounding the spiritual hunger for God. During one of the church revival programs, the Lord told me to tell the congregation to be the first and the last. You can imagine the initial reaction of the congregation. There was murmuring and near open disagreement. How could God ask them to be the first and the last? After all, the scripture warned, but many who are first will be last and the last first. Matthew chapter 19 verse 30. And that is not a blessing, but a curse. Nonetheless, God wanted to open the spiritual eyes of his children so they could understand the mysteries and the enduring nature of the race to his kingdom. The truly born of God must be the first and the last in their relationship with God. They must seek God as early as with the most treasured, valued jewel or possession. And when they find him, they must endure with him even if they are the only ones left at the end. That which is most desired and valued must be sought after very early. And if you get it, you must hold on to it very jealously to the end. It is one thing finding a treasure and another thing keeping and preserving it to the end. To show the mystery of this revelation, the Lord told me to ask the congregation what they knew and thought about Mary Magdalene. The response of that congregation and all other churches the Lord has sent me was unanimous. There was actually only one thing that the congregation remembered about Mary Magdalene, the lady whom our Lord cast out seven devils from. But is this the only reason why she's highly remembered and prominently memorized in the Bible? Was she the only sinner who had devils cast out? The Lord told me that besides the mother of the Lord, no other woman was honored and blessed as Mary Magdalene. She was the first person the Lord appeared and spoke to following his resurrection from the dead. Mary Magdalene was neither an apostle nor one of the big wigs of this world. Yet in one particular incident, she was more than all because she was the first and the last in demonstration of spiritual hunger or love for the Lord. The scriptures tell us that while Christ was being buried, Mary Magdalene was at the sepulcher, preparing the body for burial. At the approach of the Sabbath, she hurried home to wait for the end of the Sabbath. As soon as the Sabbath was over, even before the dawn of the day, this poor woman was the first to go to the tomb to see about the body of the Lord. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark. John chapter 20 verse one. I would bet that she never slept all night in anticipation of the end of the Sabbath. On getting to the tomb and finding it empty, she ran and reported her discovery to the apostles. Then apostles Peter, the rock, and John, the beloved, ran with her to the tomb and found the tomb empty. These pillars of the church went back to their homes, but Mary Magdalene refused to give up. 
Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping. John chapter 20 verses 10 to 11. This poor woman refused to leave the tomb without the body of the Lord. And she wept bitterly for and demanded of it from everyone who entered her path. The Lord could not help but reveal himself to Mary, a woman who loved and sought so much for him, being the first and the last, and was not deterred or discouraged by the reaction of others. For that reason, Mary Magdalene is forever remembered as the first human who had the exclusive honor of seeing the Lord following his resurrection. Again, the Lord said to me, the congregation should not murmur, for I am the first and the last, and all those born of me ought to be the first and the last. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. Isaiah chapter 44 verse 6. Listen to me, O Jacob, and Israel, my called. I am he, I am the first, I am also the last. Isaiah chapter 48, verse 12. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. Revelation chapter 22, verse 13. We must therefore seek God when we can find him, with all within and without us, and that time is now. We must be movable to the end, even at the face of opposition, betrayal, and tribulations, or death. Let not the love of the truth ever forsake you, and do not hesitate to forsake those things that are temporary and perishable, for the only needful and permanent treasure is in heaven. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Reciprocity. God reciprocates to every level of spiritual hunger we have for him. In other words, like every other thing, we get what we put in our hunger or love for God. We certainly cannot honestly expect five pieces of potatoes at dinner, when in reality we only boiled four pieces. God responds to us according to the intensity of our spiritual hunger for him. When God sees that heart that is seeking him above everything else and not willing to ever give up, he manifests himself greatly to that heart. In the ordinary life, we tend to naturally gravitate to the people who truly love us. We trust them as friends. We cannot ordinarily pass by their neighborhood without stopping by to see them. And we freely confer with and confide in them. This reciprocal relationship has been ever so with God from the beginning. In Genesis chapter 18, we read that while God was on his way to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he had to detour to his friend Abraham's house. It was such a close friendship that made God confide in Abraham what he was about to do. And the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am doing? Genesis chapter 18 verse 17. What an enviable relationship between God and man and all because Abraham loved God above all things. Will you be another Abraham? As with Abraham and the encounter with the resurrected Christ by Mary Magdalene, another striking example is found in the story of Zacchaeus in the Gospel of Luke chapter 19. Zacchaeus was the short rich man who was so desirous or hungry to see Jesus that he had to run ahead and climb a tree. Reciprocating, the Lord's reaction was obvious. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. 
Luke chapter 19, verse 5. It is interesting to note that although Jesus was just passing through Jericho, he could not ignore this one person who was so hungry for him. He had to detour to Zacchaeus' house. Another mystery of God's reciprocity to the spiritual hunger for him is found in the Gospel of John chapter 11. One day, while I was ministering in Africa, the Lord asked if I knew why Jesus wept for the first time. And my confident response was that Jesus wept because Lazarus, the one he loved, was dead. This is the same answer I get whenever I ask the same question to congregations. The Lord told me that was the wrong answer. How could Jesus weep for Lazarus' death when that death was designed by God to glorify both the Father and the Son? Besides, the Lord said that he would go to Bethany to raise Lazarus from the dead. There was therefore no cause for him to weep for Lazarus. Rather, he had every cause to rejoice. When Jesus heard of Lazarus' condition, he said, this sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified through it. John chapter 11, verse 4. Again, he said to his disciples, Our friend Lazarus sleeps, but I go that I may wake him up. John chapter 11, verse 11. But when Mary, Lazarus' sister, the same Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus to hear the word, and the same Mary, who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, fell at Jesus' feet weeping. Jesus, seeing the one who loved him so much in agony, was moved and groaned in the spirit and wept. Therefore, when Jesus saw her, Mary, weeping, and the Jews who came with her, weeping, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. John chapter 11 verse 33. See also John chapter 11 verse 32 verse 34 and verse 35. It is noteworthy that Martha, Mary's sister, had already seen and wept before the Lord, but her tears did not move the Lord to groan in the spirit. John chapter 11 from verses 20 to 26. It is the same when we share the agony of a beloved child or friend. But with a stranger, it may not be so. Also, the level of our spiritual hunger or love for God determines how much we are forgiven. Therefore, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Luke chapter 7, verse 47. Therefore, this is a new commandment. Be the first and the last in your relationship with God.